officers. We have a list of testimony on the No testifiers allowed. Challenger. Hey, we have a list of them. They did. I read it on the meeting. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. start then I think uh, you <coughs> okay you've done that already Abel, so come on okay so 
Okay, well, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Board of Land and Natural Resources uh, oral arguments uh, held in Hilo, Hawaii. It is um, February 12th. Uh, here we are in the uh, Hilo uh, County uh, building. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the kupuna who came and pikai the room uh, at the beginning. I'm sure that the intent really was for the, the cleansing of, of everyone uh, in the room. So I appreciate that. Mahalo to the uh, Hawaii Island uh, County uh, offices for allowing us to have this hearing in this room. I want to remind people in the audience that this is uh, oral arguments and it is not public, it's not a public hearing, so we won't be taking public testimony. It is the petitioners um, in the in the contested case hearing uh, for the <laughs> conservation district use permit that are um, to be heard today. So I just wanted to make that very, very clear. The order is the University of Hawaii will present. If they wish, they can reserve some time for rebuttal. And then the uh, petitioners uh, will present. Uh, and then the, we will close the, uh, if there is rebuttal, we'll hear rebuttal. And then we will close the hearing with decision making to uh, be done at a later time. So with that, um, Aloha, we'll start with uh, Kim Lui Kwan. My name is Tim Lui Kwan. I'll be presenting the final arguments for the applicant University of Hawaii Shimon. With me today are members of members of my our legal team. I have Ben Sanders and I have Ben on the right. Excuse me. Um, one other piece of information that's important is each side is going to be given 30 minutes to present. Do you want to reserve time for rebuttal at this time? Uh, yes, I would like to reserve um, at least 10 minutes um, of uh, 30 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, the timekeeper can actually prompt me at 15 minutes to be appreciated. So I'll just so your time begins now. Okay, Gene, how's it? It's okay? Okay, thank you. Um, also with me today is uh, University of Hawaii and Hilo Chancellor Dr. Donald Strain and, and Ms. Stephanie Nagata, who is Director of the Office of Monarchy and Management for Hawaii Community College. Uh, we'd like to thank the board for the uh, department staff for coming to Hilo today to hold all our arguments. In the contested case hearing of this application, the construction of 30 meter telescope, more easily referred to as the TMP. It has been nearly two years to the day, or PSC, fortnight shy, since this board issued its preliminary ruling on the TMP application, ordering the holding of this contested case. Proceedings in which the parties were put to their proof in providing credible evidence supporting their claims and ultimately their position on whether. The conservation district use permit should be issued. However, the evidentiary proceedings before the hearing officer is done, and the parties are here to meet, provide you uh, with a summary of legal reasons why they should prevail, a summation of the evidence, and legal authority. While an important part of the due process, oral argument is not evidence, it is only argument. It's important to keep in mind the scientific and educational purpose of this project which is considered when completed along with the large Hadron Collider constructed at CERN Project in Switzerland to be one of the two greatest scientific achievements of this century. As noted by Professor Michael Bolt in his testimony, the study and observation of the universe is the oldest of exact sciences that stretches far back into man's prehistory. Astronomy is one of the first subjects recorded in historical accounts by the planet's earliest letter civilizations. In ancient Egypt, the date for the Annual flight of the Nile was predicted by the helical rising of the star. Um, their observations of the heavens also the main kingdoms of Central America when they were war. The Chinese went to start the new year, including the flight chart. Our earliest known <coughs> observations allowed us to measure time, when and what to hunt, gather, plant, 
later that study the stars and planets took us to far places, countless journeys over trackless expanses and made it possible for us to navigate our way home. We have seen the rise and fall of every great civilization and witness the creation of all the world's religions, often providing the foundations for religious beliefs and cultural practices. And as believers with proof that a universe so large and complex could only be the work of God or gods. So we're entwined in our history with the study of religion and astronomy, the science of astronomy, that it was not separated <coughs> in the West until the time of Galileo and Newton. In the present, we find evidence of our origins of that universe, which is the totality of all space, high and matter, and energy. As described in the application, it's affirmed by the evidence submitted by the applicant. Uh, during the hearings, the PMP is not just another telescope. Its segmented primary mirror scanning unit, 100 feet, will be 10 times more powerful and far more advanced than the largest telescope in operation today, uh, the twin tech telescopes monitor here, allowing us to see further, farther and with more detail than any human operation. Once the PMP is operational, it will be the first and the next generation of giant telescopes that will seek the answers for questions on the nature, origin, and the composition of the universe, and whether there is life elsewhere out there. The selection of Mauna Kea at the site for the construction of the PMP is essential if Mauna Kea will continue to be the world's best ground-based viewing platform for astronomy. After considering six possible locations in Chile, Mexico, and Hawaii, it was determined that Mauna Kea's viewing condition is high altitude, atmospheric clarity, relative darkness, together with the accessibility of the Mauna Kea Science Reserve and its outstanding support facilities and infrastructure. The neighboring observatories and the supportive local community made the selection an easy choice. Its location on the mountain's northwestern plateau was identified in the 2000 master plan. Excuse me. It's best suited for this type of observatory. At a lower elevation, and less visible than the other telescopes within the precinct, while avoiding the most sensitive areas in terms of Mauna Kea's natural and cultural resources. The location selected provides additional mitigation while providing access to the spectacular night sky, another precious resource of Mauna Kea, allowing the PMP universe, Professor Bolte, a wonderful unit, unit to the universe. Current investment in astronomy and Mauna Kea is close to $1 billion. However, the investment of the PMP project and other supporting services is expected to more than double that by the time the facility is completed. The project will be an enormous benefit to the public welfare and bring significant monies to the local economy as well as contribute new programs and funds to the Nevada schools. Moreover, these benefits will be vetted and discussed with the community and all, and all of the public meetings during the planning process and described in the record the PMP project will, employ, will provide employment and educational opportunities for Hawaii in a clean, high-tech endeavor that will be a source of pride for the community while advancing our understanding of the universe. Petitioners here have been involved in the planning process long before the submission of this application in September 2010. However, without planning, they have been denied due process in the proceedings. The truth is that most of the same petitioners have been involved in the planning process from the very beginning, even bringing the challenge to the board's adoption of um, the Mauna Kea Comprehensive Man Management Plan, the CMP, and its subplans, uh, though resulting instead in the Indian Court of Appeals affirmation of the board's action and, and process in approving the CMP. Petitioners have had an abundance of due process, and they have had more than ample opportunity to prove their claim that the board's criteria for issuance of the CDUP for the construction and operation of the PMP um, has not been met. They submitted testimony at the public hearing of the application, fully participated in the contested case hearings held over a six month period in 2011, and reflected on the proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law. Um, what the petitioners experienced was not a denial of due process, it was a failure of proof. Failure proof to support their claims, claims they argued vigorously, repeatedly, and repeatedly. In truth, they would oppose any further telescope development, no matter where placed within the astronomy precinct, 
to know better what manner of construction. The board delegated to the hearing officer the responsibility to hear, review, and consider evidence offered by the parties in support of the respective positions. His proposed findings and conclusions should be afforded considerable deference as he was able to assess the credibility, the demeanor of the witnesses during the testimony, and weigh the evidence submitted in proof of their claims. The applicant supports the finding and conclusion proposed by the hearing officer subject to a few suggested additions and changes as set out in our January 9, 2013 exceptions. As noted in our exceptions, it is the university's position that the findings and conclusion proposed by the hearing officer on November 30, 2012 are overwhelmingly correct and deal with several areas that require clarification to more fully and clearly reflect the proceedings. The proposed exceptions seek more clarification rather than substantially modify the hearing officer's proposed determinations. While these suggestions are detailed in our submitted exceptions, I did want to outline several, including clarification of the scope of this board's action on February 25, 2011, which was not the board's final action on the application. In light of your simultaneous ordering of the contested case on your own motion and the board's imposition of Condition 21, prohibiting any construction unless and until a final decision was rendered in favor of the applicant at the conclusion of the contested case. The applicant further suggests that the proposed conclusions also reflect the Hawaii Supreme Court's intervening decision in the state v. Pratt v. Pratt that was handed down and decided in 2012. The holding of Pratt is relevant to the issues in this contested case as the Pratt court confirmed that even if all three elements of the Hanukkah test are met, the privilege for Native Hawaiian customary and traditional practices are not absolute and may be subject to reasonable state regulation. The Pratt court directed that claims of right must be considered within a totality of circumstances where there must be a balancing of the state's interest in the subject regulation to the right of the individual in the exercise of a particular practice. The other significant exception, suggestion is an exception to the proposed findings and conclusion that accurately reflects the petitioner's failure of proof that the first prong of the Hanukkah test, as petitioners did not submit direct testimony or specific evidence that they are, quote, descendants of Native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. This is a specific elementary requirement set out in Hanukkah, Pash, and Pratt. All three cases talk about the elementary requirement. While several of the petitioners testified that, in fact, they were Native Hawaiians, none submitted testimony and evidence of evidence demonstrating descent from Native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. The hearing officer correctly found and concluded that the KMP project satisfies eight criteria of HAR, Hawaii Administrative Rules, Section 13-5-30, Subsection C. While petitioners claim that all eight criteria must be satisfied in issuing the CDP, the argument is pointless as the hearing officer correctly concluded that the criteria, all the criteria of Subsection C are actually satisfied. The hearing officer concluded correctly that the project is consistent with the purpose of the district, the conservation district, as one of the specific objectives of the district is to conserve and protect important resources through appropriate management. This is exactly what has been accomplished in this project, the adoption of the KMP project plan that is consistent with the state's CMP for Mauna Kea. The management plan specifically and thoughtfully addresses Mauna Kea's natural and cultural resources, including the environmental factors that make Mauna Kea arguably the best place on earth to put telescopes. The express purpose of the district rules is to regulate land use, not to prohibit land use as claimed by the petitioners. The hearing officer also correctly concluded that the project is consistent with the objectives of the resource subzone as astronomy facilities are expressly permitted in the subzone under an approved management plan. And again, under Subsection C criteria, the hearing officer correctly found that the project complies with the guidelines and provisions set out in HRF Chapter 205A of the CZMA. 
This is the only CZA objective for the project, which concerns uh, the protection of water quality. The applicant's witnesses provided testimony that the project has been designed so that wastewater pollutants would not be released into the surrounding environment. Petitioner's assertion that the TMP would undermine important view plans, destroy areas of historic importance, and increase the risk of water pollution were considered and rejected by the hearing officer. Uh, the hearing officer was responsible for weighing the evidence and assessing the credibility of the witnesses. The hearing officer also concluded that there would not be that the project would not cause substantial impacts to existing natural resources within the surrounding area community region. Um, and we've uh, detailed in, in considerable detail um, uh, the reasons why uh, we correctly found that. We also correctly concluded that the proposed land use is compatible with the locality and surrounding areas. While petitioners admit there are numerous observatories visible for the project and the surrounding areas, they wrongly contend that the project must reduce the cumulative impacts created by existing uh, facilities to lessen substantial significant adverse. This was rejected by the hearing officer who concluded that the project had satisfied this criterion. Um, under the, the next, the hearing officer found that the project preserves, correctly found that it, it, the project preserves and improves upon the existing physical and environmental aspects of land. Petitioners interpret this to prohibit adding any structure where none currently exists in subtop, even where the regulations expressly permit astronomy facilities and other structures under, manage, under a uh, appropriate management plan. To conclude that this criterion must be interpreted to literally mean that nothing can be built on any part of the district would lead to an absurd, an absurd or unjust result. This was rejected by the hearing officer who concluded that this criterion was also met. He also found, hearing also also found that, um, that there would be no subdivision of land utilized to increase the intensity of land uses in the conservation district. Uh, the reason for this is the applicant is not seeking the subdivision of land, nor is one being granted by the board. Even if we were seeking any, but um, government agencies and agencies of the state and the counties are not subject to uh, that provision, site, provision of, of the HRS signed by the petition. Legally and factually, there has been and will be no subdivision. <coughs> um, petitioners also presented no credible, credible evidence of any detriment uh, to public health, safety, and welfare in Montana. Um, we found that the university's experts and evidence were more credible and in rejecting petitioners' claims. And I would like to um, thank the board again for the opportunity for the submission of the applicant's petition. That the proposed findings and fact conclusions of the law are correct. Um, if the exceptions suggested by the applicant in our January 9th, 2015 submission are also adopted by the board, I wanted to recognize the patient and effort of the hearing officer to conduct the investigative proceedings. I would also like to note the conduct performance of the petitioner and what, just, what has been a long and sometimes tedious process. The parties have all acted professionally and respectfully towards the hearing officer, the applicant, and each other, and I commend them again for this. I'd like to reserve again the remaining time that I have for the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Um, Next petitioner up is Kinohi Neves for Paul Neves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Okay, let's have some order here. No, I'll stay my 
Abel, Abel. Abel. Nobody's washing it with you. Abel, I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on, Abel. Thank you. You're cutting into the petitioner's time, Abel. You know, we're going we're gonna to start now. Your 30 minutes starts now. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Pinoy Nevis. I'm speaking on behalf of my father, Paul K. Nevis. <coughs> Aloha to the God whose name is so sacred, it is not spoken in the open, but in the reverent silence of the believer. Aloha in Akini Apua, the four gods of state, Pu, Pane, Lono, and Kanaloa, the 40 gods, the 400 gods, the 4,000 gods, the 40,000 gods, the 400,000 gods, and all the manifestations of the one God whose sacred name is in the whisper. All you spirits of the departed who have been cared for with love, I welcome you here. Aloha ina omakua, you personal and family guardians. Advise and guide us, and do what you must to strengthen our relationships with each other and the land. Aloha na'ali'i, fellow activists, customary leadership, whose kuleana is to continue the flow of mana. Blessings for all our people, your fellow countrymen, by being generous and productive resource managers. You have been an eyewitness to all that Akua has provided from time immemorable to our people and our land. You have also been an eyewitness to an ongoing crime scene of unspeakable proportion upon those same people and those same lands. You Ali'i men and Ali'i women, fellow activists, we are all called to serve our people with our very lives these days and times require that we give our very life for our country, the Hawaiian Kingdom. This nation will require a new age of heroes who have integrity and honor, morals, ethics, compassion, self-sacrifice, and a desire to fight and serve their own country. No foreign entity, occupational authority, or an agency of any state can ever erase the crime scene. Only generous and competent leaders who serve with integrity can begin to heal our people and our land and rediscover our destiny as a free and independent people. From Mauna Kea comes the snow and ice, solitude and quiet to nurture the hearts and minds of the people. Do not sell out and the people will remember your name with honor. Give in to today's desires of money, power, and personal gratification, and your name will be spoken in shame and without honor, maybe not even at all. Aloha na kupuna na mapua, our elders and fellow parents and workers. We have searched in the last 40 years the truth of what happened to our people and our nationhood. The state of Hawaii didn't help us in our search, neither did the United States of America. We, the Kanaka Maui people, and our friends did the searching ourselves. Out of our own despair and empty pockets, at work and after work, from a secretary's desk or from a tent in some remote beach. We did it ourselves, with our copy machines, our notepads and flyers, and in our protests and marches, our arrests and sit-ins, our voices and our burning desire for justice. Yes, many kupuna and makua have died giving rebirth to a nation reborn, a patriotic duty to a good and decent cause. Stand up, we did, and encouraged our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to do the same. 
for the truth the, for the truth does matter doesn't it the lies that we were taught or forced to listen to since 1893 were educational indoctrination genocide of the worst sort a living death sentence for the people of this land and our fellow Hawaiian nationals there is no going back to a time when the occupation did all it could to erase our spiritual will to live, our cultural knowledge to survive, and our political nationality to be free. Aloha opio, keiki, and kamalihi, our young people, children, and babies. Know you are loved. Know that what we are doing is to ensure that your land, this land, your inheritance, our Aina will be here for you to live upon and for you to pass on to your descendants. It is what we must do and what you will have to do when our nation calls. So learn to watch and listen carefully. Never fear to speak out for this land and your people. Call the lawyer, call the lawyer out to task and a senator to service. They are no better than you. In fact, they may be far behind. Your culture extends thousands of years. What has been their experience on the world stage? 235 years. Know that your ancestors were warriors and healers, planners and builders, navigators and farmers, philosophers and poets, dancers and fishermen, priests and astrologers, leaders and team players scientists and sportsmen, clean and hardworking, deeply religious and spiritually active. Be proud and follow in their path as we do. Know that they and we are always with you. Okia Kamanava, now is the time. It has taken me 45 years to find myself as a spirit-led being, culturally a Kanaka Maoli native person and politically a Hawaiian national. I can recall my journey beginning with the simple stories from my mother. Her memories of the pain of disenfranchisement, ridicule and survival under the yoke of a foreign master, the United States. These stories were my mother's love for a confused young man of 13 years old. They were told in a style that at times made me cry and laugh, but most of all, set me on a path to save myself. They were inspirational and clear, deeply spiritual, culturally beautiful, and bitterly political. I was broken, angry like many of my brothers and sisters. Mauna Awakea is that Vahipana that sacred place that has made me a whole person. No longer do I need to seek refuge somewhere in a godless world that follows a godless path. The spiritual worship on and with the spiritual life of Mauna Kea completes my lifelong search for who I am as a Kanaka, a free Hawaiian man. To this Mauna Kea, I owe my life story, my mother's prayers, my wife's love, and my children's future. Mauna Kea is that natural environment that breathes life into me and causes me to reflect on the creative spirit within me. The shadow of Mauna Kea holds my heart close in the early evening and renews my daily walk each and every new day. Over the past 15 years, I have become a more creative, and tolerant person because of my relationship to the mountain. I hold my people in a more hopeful light, with less doubt and with a greater anticipation of a brighter future. Mauna Kea has restored my family beyond my greatest aspirations. As I have witnessed this transformation, so also have I witnessed the transformation of many others as they sought answers to questions deep in their hearts. Time and time again, Mauna Kea has spoken to the many. Many people who truly seek out the creative force of Mauna Kea 
that emanates in this most sacred place. Every morning I look to Mauna Kea and acknowledge what Keakua has done for me, for my family and for my people. Mauna Kea is the Creator's home, the Pico, the center force, the greatest temple on earth. As an Ali'i, I am honored and humbled by Mauna Kea and will continue to encourage the spiritual enlightenment that Mauna Kea brings to the human community. As a Kumuhula, I am inspired by Mauna Kea each and every day. I will continue to do all I can to keep Mauna Kea accessible to all who <coughs> seek spiritual refreshment and renewal. As a husband and father, I have an obligation for the welfare of my ohana to live the breath of Mauna Kea within me and in all that I do and say. If I need to be a warrior, so be it. But it will be a warrior armed with aloha. The 30 millimeter telescope TNT, telescope development, in this my sacred temple of religious practice will seriously interfere with my ability to adore <coughs> Mauna Kea. How can we put our shattered lives back together again if these foreign objects are allowed to alter the natural landscape in the natural temple, Mauna Kea? As our kupuna have said, when is enough enough? How can we be in solitude and beauty with these foreign objects in our view planes? View planes that have existed since these islands were created by Kiafua. I recognize the natural view planes created by Kiafua. What church of these foreigners would allow such a desecration before their altar? What would they allow it to be? Would a camouflage be acceptable? A paint job? Would they tell their congregation to just look the other way? Would they take money to look the other way? Would the interests outside of their church be allowed to dictate the process? Wouldn't that church consider this sacrilegious? Why is Mauna Kea allowed to be desecrated but not St. Peter's. Could it be that the godless are worshiping a golden calf? Why are the laws that are in place to protect the trust lands of the native Hawaiians and the general public being broken without objection? What are regulations like the eight criteria for a conservation district use permit for? H.A.R. 13.530, criteria number one. The proposed land use is consistent with the purpose of a conservation district. How can this 18-story building be consistent with conservation? That's impossible. A conservation district is to conserve land deemed very important. By developing that land, you devalue its purpose. To contemplate developing conservation land, you bring injury upon us who worship there and are practicing our customs. Are not the laws in place to protect the land and the people's interests? They clearly are written to be followed, are they not? Does a developer pick and choose which ones he wishes to adhere to? Why do we have regulators who are failing miserably in their oversight? Is mitigation part of the eight criteria? Where is that found in the statutes? Why do we have regulators who are failing miserably in their oversight? Is mitigation part of the A criteria. Where is that found in the statutes? Why do the elected officials show no backbone when these laws and regulations are being broken? Where are the cops? Why is someone not being arrested? Is this not a crime scene? Criteria number four. 
The proposed land will not cause substantial adverse impacts to existing natural resources within the surrounding area, community, or region. It is quite obvious that this TMT proposal will impact the natural resources, the surrounding area, the community, in fact, the whole island. You can't hide a huge thing like the TMT proposal by air, land, or sea. How that would hurt us who need a spiritual place in this natural setting to keep our lives together. Criteria number six, the existing physical and environmental aspects of land, such as natural beauty and open space characteristics will be preserved or improved upon whichever is applicable. Natural as defined by Webster's dictionary means produced or existing by nature, not artificial. Natural in Hawaiian dictionary, among other things, means honest, decent, proper, appropriate, satisfactory, rightful, reliable, right, just, fair, qualified, suitable, advisable, seemly, fit, natural, applicable, nearby, worth, and merit. This TMT proposal does not fit criteria number six, nor does it preserve or improve upon the open space that exists there at this very moment. And this is why I'm absolutely against this TMT proposal and any other proposal on sacred Mauna Kea, our place of worship and religious practice. How can we practice our customs and grow spiritually when our spiritual place and natural setting is used for 18 story buildings, parking lots, pool stations, and roads? It would be another slap in the face and stab in the back to build this monster in our temple of prayer. I have lived long enough to hear and see my people cry, and still the state of Hawaii gives the rubber stamp to development after development after development. Many have given up on justice. I don't blame them because no one was arrested on the USS Boston for January 16, 1893, either. No one was court-martialed. No one was arrested on the U.S. Minister Stevens. No one could be arrested for breaking the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom and properly tried for high treason, as they should have been. Rather, the Queen was arrested for treason in her own country and imprisoned in her own palace. No one was arrested for looting the treasury and paying themselves for their work. <coughs> Who is liable for monetary damages for destruction of the land in the conservation district? Who is liable for past destruction on the conservation district? Myself and my family have had to use our own financial resources for 15 years to fight for Mauna Awakea, even though the protections are already in the law. Why was the BLNR not advocating to protect these public trust lands? No one was arrested for banning the Hawaiian national language and forcing the Kanaka to obey or else. No one was arrested for putting the American flag, a foreign flag, over our islands. No one was ever arrested for teaching lies in the public schools. No one was arrested for terrorizing and intimidating our Hawaiian nationals with statehood or the Hawaiian Homes Department scandals. These and other crimes were committed against a free and friendly nation under treaty with the United States of America. No one has done or did anything about the crime scene. My survival and the survival of my family is threatened by the TMT proposal. 
the natural view plains from Mauna Kea to Haleakala I have spoken of before in a previous contested case. From Pu'ukea to Haleakala, there is the connection for my family all the way to just above Poliahuheyao on Kauai. We are the Kea family. <coughs> my children were named for this natural view plane so that they can never forget where they come from <coughs> and how we are connected. This TMT proposal puts another stress upon my freedom to worship at Mauna Awakea. My freedom to practice my culture as a kuni ula and an ali'i in my homeland in and around Mauna Awakea. Most importantly, my freedom to be free from the occupation of the United States of America. <coughs> Deny the TMT proposal. It injures my spirit, my well-being, and the future of my children. I cannot relinquish my spiritual practice or spiritual space to anyone. In the end, that's all that I really have is my freedom. Mahalo. Thank you. that you speak of? Uh, I was about, I was about 15. 15. And you were able to experience Mauna Kea and receive this, this EK with the existing telescopes on Mauna Kea. Just a yes, simple question. No, no, no hidden agenda, just simple question. Answer it. Thank you. Thank you.
my grandfather.
allowed to answer to that question. Who, who here for outside of the university is not in the Who of you would take responsibility for what's going on? Who of you, when our grandchildren is stuck with us and their heart is sore and they say, Ma, how did you ever make that? Get this up there. I'm going to look at that every day, just like you see it here. The school is right next to the Mauna. They're going to be looking up at that every day. Me and my man are for eternity. And I have to say, no. No. Don't do that. Not this time. Not tomorrow. Not even today. Because you have to wear the suit you have this time. Not this time. Information on 
and information has been omitted from it, and the information has been manipulated to downplay the impact of the natural resource. So you look at this graph, this diagram, figure 4.1, and you actually look at the other figure. This is from the archaeologist report. This is what should have been in the CUA. Look at it. Look at all the sites there, all the numbers. I mean, my middle school, seventh grade daughter, I just showed her these two figures. Is. What's the difference between the two? Well, there's a lot missing from this. I mean, my seventh graders tell me that. I need to ask them, is that the difference between the two? This is what should have been in the CUA. So what they did instead, they put a, they, they telescope they into this, so you're able to see what the applicant wanted to see. In addition to that, well, how they falsified the information, if you see on to the right-hand side of the figure, there are these Five. triangles. Yeah. These triangles represent historic sites. <coughs> Someone deleted all the numbers off these sites. Right, <laughs> why the numbers should have been deleted. Mm. The only reason why someone would delete the numbers is so that they would downplay or seem like there were historic and cultural sites in the area. But somebody had to go through it. It's not like it was an accident. It shifted the paper and if the numbers fell off, <laughs> you would know the numbers are there. <laughs> so I might deliberately remove that. And, and, the, and the, the legal counsel is saying there's no evidence. The evidence is in the record itself. The evidence is in the archaeology report. It's been manipulated. Now, so to expand beyond, if you go, if you read through the CUA, they left out certain information. So the CUA only talks about four sites. They left out descriptions about 221, 447. They left out any description about 621, 629, even though it's on the map. But what they also left out in this whole report, <coughs> the CUA, I should say, it's all in the archaeologist report, but they also left out for significant information and stuff. So when you look through the page 41 in the CUA, they, they even omitted information, but even on the diagram with the numbers. It's a, it's, I, I've been in the, I, I'm standing in the community before, I've been through reports. I actually wrote reports. I know when someone is trying to manipulate the information so that you only see a certain aspect of it. But in reality, this whole, the honesty of site reserve is part of the, the Mauna Kea region. So the Monica, the Monica Science Reserve is in the Monica Summit Region Historic District. What does that mean? This whole part here is part of the Historic District. As part of the Historic District, you, this recommendation rule says that you have to look at everything collectively. You can't look at this individual site next to the, the project. None of the reports have done that. I'm going to show all the archaeology reports, numbers of this, that report. None of them mention what is the impact of this project upon the connective sites within that area. And the sites we are referring to, the sites we're talking about, are these shrines. These shrines that are there on the summit there, in the area where the CT is supposed to be built. These are shrines that have connection with our ancestors, the Kukunas, and even with us today. This is where our Kukunas used to pray. And you know what's so remarkable about all these reports? No one ever asked a Hawaiian or Kanaka Maori what those shrines were. We've been up to those shrines, and our daughter, they shared what those shrines were. There are places they did pilgrimages up to the Maori. They connected with those of the, the heavens and the earth. Their prayers were done in these shrines. However, no information is talked about how to do that these shrines, even though the people are being built amongst these Another thing, they left out all these other things, they call fine spots. The fine spots, the alternative, uh, they come to argue that the fine spots are modern. They're not modern. The problem is, that a full ana ana analysis has never been done of it. If you look at the archaeology report, they've never completed determining what they are or not. So if there's a stone there, we don't know what the stone is, or how long it's been there, unless there's some cultural matter or material years there. Some of these sites that they call them fine spots because they, don't, they cannot figure what they are, are less than minerals. They're not given a historic preservation of it. But they're significant. There might be a few, a handful that are modern in context that somebody went there. But most of them are not modern as this thing implies. Yeah, we're not putting them in. So that just goes to, so the significant information that's been falsified, that's been accurate or incomplete in the historic as well as the cultural resources and historic preservation. That's the cultural resources and historic property part of the CUA. Even the things that were left out. 
after committing. You know, the part of what I find here is how do you improve upon the existing, or how do you preserve the existing characteristics of the land that you're being able to see? This project will not. <coughs> right now, there's nothing there. If you go on the FACO where it's supposed to build this city, there's nothing here on the FACO. And when you go to what they call mitigation for this, there's a couple of mitigation it's, it's referred to. One of the mitigation for this project is they said, well, we're not going to build on the summit. That's inaccurate because there's no space on the summit to build anything more. So how can there be a mitigated measure? If you cannot build on the summit, because there's no room in the space. Look in the, I, 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 look in the master plan. Monica master plan. They will tell you <coughs> that for the size of this proposed telescope, there's no more space on the mountain on the summit there for any more telescopes there. So that's why they're moving down to the northern boundary. They occupy the summit. You can't, you can't put it up anywhere out there. And neither any of those out there wishing to give up their, their real estate. Nobody can say, I'll give up my space for this just for 30 meters. Nobody is. So that that's gonna be a mitigation for this. Another another mitig another mitigation that they talked about in this, in this EUA, which is inaccurate, is that they say the coding of the dome with, with a respective aluminum-like coding is going to respect the, it's going to respect the sky and earth. That is so inaccurate. Like, who, who have you checked? Is anybody in the RFA have you checked that? I don't know if they're going to mount it, they tell you that's not so, because the dome shape of the proposed telescope does not reflect the sky, and it does not reflect the ground. Just to, just, it's a fine thing. What it does, it reflects light back into your eyes. And so when you look in the, when you look in the CUA, they're making comparison. They're trying to compare the CNC observatory, a little light image, to the Subaru observatory. The Subaru is this size. The Subaru is a cylinder shape observatory. But they should have been comparing it with the Gemini observatory, which is a dome shape. It's a difference. Because when you look at the Subaru, it doesn't respect the, the light back into you. And it does respect the sky, but it's a cylinder shape. <coughs> the CNC is a dome shape. It reflects light right back into your eyes. And so that aluminum <coughs> light covering is not going to respect the sky and the ground as a being supplied in accurately in the field. It also it says that in the, it says that the Monarch Hill in Master Plan. It says that to quote the Master Plan, as much as possible, surface should not be surfaces should be non-reflective in the visual spectrum to minimize glare and visibility from distances. Reflective materials are to be avoided. That's from the Master Plan two thousand. And yet they say now they say now no, it, it is good. So they had changed. One report to the next has changed. But whoever looked in the back of the, the master plan to verify whether the information is correct or not. Okay, height of the building. Let's just give you a, for, uh, a reference. Since you guys have years that's running both two buildings, the height of the state capitol, when you walk out on Punch Bowl Street and you look at the state capitol in the next community, the state capitol is 100 feet high. The CMC is almost twice as high as that. That's how big it is. That's a reference point. It's almost, here's the TNT, next to the state capitol, it's almost twice as high. It's close to 190 feet. And it's 200 something feet wide. Don't tell me that's not significant. Every time you go out to your meeting, step outside and take a break and look at the state capitol, say that's not significant. For those here in the state, it's not significant. When you leave this room, walk out to the state, the parking lot, look at that state building. The state building, we put four and a half height of the state building. That's how high the, the TNC. What the site? Put four and a half buildings of the state building right outside here. That's how high the TNC observatory is. And the width of it is the same width as, as, that, as that state building. In fact, it's wider than the state building. That's how significant it is. It is so significant, you can't even say how it is. So where are we at? This is from, this is from the their own document. Here is the observatories now. Here they want to put the TNT. There's nothing there. 
Exactly. Is this the board at this point in time will be the one to say yes to this? Where the previous board, how did we get to a point where all the records of documents says the impacts are already substantial and significant on the Maui? It's already stated there. So is this the board in time? And the history book will read that this is the board that approved this? Or in the book of the universe at some time, <coughs> at this, or at this point in time, say this is not significant? It is. There's nothing there on the, on the northern plateau. <coughs> The mountain is still sacred. Yeah. And the, 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 as those guardians of the mountain have shared with us, life sources and energy come into the mountain. And we also use the top of the mountain. The people, 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 the and the only thing that nature can do in those large areas is to protect it. And whether it's a shaking of the mountain, or whether it's just kind of coming down here, you know, they, they're not there to, they're, those are the mountains that are there to protect and to keep things in balance. But this one is pushing way off the balance more than it has, has done already. So in concluding, and I'll give you my written testimony afterwards, Copy. But I also like to mention that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, in regards to this contested case, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Board of Trustees passed the following resolution on January 3rd, 2013, that states a resolution urging the Board of Land and Natural Resources to ex exercise the highest possible level, level of stewardship to afford the strongest consideration to the rights and actions of the Hawaiian Objective by proposed development, including those of all conservation In closing, there's just so much to go through in this time. I can only point out a few of them, but if you want to see the rest of it, read, our, read, read the petitioner's response, read the petitioner's findings and facts. If you want to find more of what the mountain has said to us, read our testimony. It's in our testimony. And I'm not sure everyone, as a board member, you had a chance to read it there. But if you want to know more about the state on the mountain, things on the mountain, read our testimony or the history we can read. Other than that, I just want to say that we say our mauna, mauna wakke is a people, a people's people. Are we as a man or a white person? Is the name of the land or some people of the land? Is the name of all That's what the mountain is for. The sacred is for these mountains. And this project is so true, it's so great. It's the source. The universe is putting it here, but put it in put this building up on the planet. Mm -hmm. They put it in the building on Kauai. Right? The coconut pipe level wouldn't have allowed them to build it up. They put it in the building in the county of Maui. A county has a soul where 90 feet in a commercial and resort area got it's a pipe in Sepulchilo, the Kilo, that the two places you get 120 feet. Now, why is a county have have these protections to protect the open space they have to use to cut off at 120 feet and actually at 90 feet on the other side? How can we allow that to plant more on the mountain? Eighteen stories, you can't even build that here on, on, on down below that. How can that justify putting it on top of the whole? Yeah. You couldn't even build it on Hawaii. You wouldn't even build it on Maui, in the county of Maui. So why is this time that we think, okay, it's all right to build it on top of the Maui? The most sacred to it on Mount Fuji. The most sacred to it. But we don't want to put it on Mount Fuji because there's a connection. There's a, there's a mountain to us, there's a connection to Mount Fuji. And, and those, whose, those whose ancestors who came here from Japan, if you were to take this project to, to Japan, they'll be deeply offended. If those who are from California were to take this project and say to build it on Mount Shasta, Ooh. The people there, the native people, and, and all the other people will be deeply offended to bring for such a project. Well. But why, why Mr. are we give him more time. Yeah, I'm just asking Please. to summarize. Thank you. Please give him more time. So at this point in time, we just want to say, we just want to say that we so just want to conclude by saying, well, everything is For the project or not for the project, we all we all have to be We just want to say a lot to all those who have a lot of this time. We just do 
the bike thing that you like to have <coughs> those things in your play, but there's a lot of things that help to include it as a part of the class as a part of our Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Remember you stay your name. I think hello, Mike. It's I, I have a question, but you will allow me to answer the question. Sure. It's a question of four. From up here. My question is, um, should this be allowed to go forward? Would you stop going to the market? Uh, hey, I'm doing my job, okay? Okay, it's her turn. You're taking time away from her. Well, I think you should apologize to her. Don't apologize to me. Um, question is, when you go up the mountain, you, you say you go up every month. When you go up there, do you go as a family or as a group of people also? Uh, it all depends. Depends. It all depends. Sometimes my own family needs to go up because we are So, so it could be more than once a month that you go up there. Thank you. 
the mountains of Judah, all connected, they're all one. And they're coming out, and more people are seeing the feeling. And that's something that's happening to us in to this day, here now. And so for some healing, because they say that if it's cut up that they will use all that teaching, that knowledge, what we have to ask that. I see you. And I say for some healing. Thank you. My name is Pilani Tongan. I'm here on behalf of Kahea, the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance. It's been a long time since we saw each other last. By my count, it's two years since we met. I can't imagine why it's taken so long. It took the hearing officer's report a year to be released, even though it's basically a copy and paste of the university's proposed finding facts. I object to how long this process has taken. It has really taken a toll on every one of the petitioners, probably the applicants as well. Uh, and I really want the Board of Natural Resources on a, in a broader way to take back to, and take to heart how far this process is on people. All of the petitioners are volunteers. All of them have personally put up their own money to participate in this type of case hearing. And for this process to take two years, even more, leading up to that February hearing in 2010, is unacceptable. Because it's taken so long, I feel it's important to remind you why we're here. We are here today because the university has failed to fulfill its obligation to protect the conservation district of Mauna Kea for many decades. The eight criteria of the conservation district rules direct the board to put the natural resources of the conservation district at the center of its decision making. When we focus on the resources and when we make decisions in their best interest, then the intent of the conservation district rules will be satisfied and our natural resources will actually thrive. As it is, the university and past boards have put the interest of the developers at the center of their decision making, not the resources. And it shows. The summit is 38 feet shorter than it was before a telescope was founded. Invasive species are advancing at the mountain. And it is by focusing on developer interests that the university now attempts to justify expanding the industrial footprint of telescopes on Mauna Kea. Their argument continues to focus on the seeing conditions of the mountain rather than the natural resources that are identified for protection in the conservation district rules. The fact that Mauna Kea has good seeing conditions for astronomy, for modern astronomy, does not mandate another telescope be built there. And beaches are an ideal place to put hotels from a developer's perspective, but that does not make it a good idea. The university seeks to disavow itself from its history of mismanagement on Mauna Kea, the many mercury spills, the harassment of Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. But the fact is, this is the existing environmental aspect of the land that criterion number five requires to be improved upon. The existing conditions of the resources on Mauna Kea are the direct result of the industrialization caused by telescopes on the mountain. And the telescopes on the mountain are the direct result of the university's advocacy, the facilitation of development 
of the Mount Akita Conservation District. The university is the primary advocate for every single telescope on Mount Akita. It cannot now stand before the board and say they will not be responsible for the harm caused by their past actions. The university has an obligation to improve upon the existing resources of Mount Akita because it facilitated the current damage that is suffered by the resources. And because the rules mandate applicants improve upon the natural environment in which they are building. Now, the university have you believe that that's an absurd interpretation that can never build in a conservation district. <coughs> that's not true. In this situation, to comply with criteria number five would mean fully restoring two current telescope sites before considering the proposal for a new one. As it is, the university makes empty promises to decommission telescopes in the future. Not only does the decommissioning plan not guarantee that a site will be fully restored to its natural condition, it's not part of this permanent application. There's no way for you to actually enforce that and make sure it happens. The university is promising to you now, please give us this permit to build and we promise someday in the distant future we will consider a decommissioning. You have to ask yourself, what is inside the permanent application? What did they actually apply for? And they applied to build. They did not apply to decommission, to restore anything on the mountain. Instead of improving upon the natural environment and ensuring that the project would not have additional substantial adverse impact on the mountain, the university relies heavily on its comprehensive management plan. It's a great title, comprehensive management plan, but we know what they say about cover. Looking deeper into the same issue reveals that it's actually more accurately described as an assessment plan, a plan for conducting future studies. For example, the Comprehensive Management Plan has 103 action items. Of those, 36 were deemed directly applicable to the TMT. Of those 36, 14 are planning and monitoring along the lines of study methods of invasive species spread as opposed to actually stopping the spread of invasive species. Educate people about the historic, cultural, and natural resources of Mauna Kea as opposed to actually protecting them. Encourage observatories to investigate options to reduce the use of hazardous materials in telescope op operations, as opposed to actually stopping the use of hazardous materials on Mauna Kea. The only real actions that were identified in, in the TMT management plan were things like prevent light pollution, which serves the TMT's interests, and follow the law, which is interesting because it kind of goes back. These are nice first steps. I don't want to uh, put down the fact that we're going to educate people about the resources of Mount Akea or that we're going to try and figure out and think about how we cannot use hazardous material. But these are first steps. This falls far short from offsetting the harm currently suffered on Mount Akea. And it definitely does not justify building another telescope, expanding the industrial footprint on Mount Akea. Even after the university consulted with Native Hawaiian practitioners over many years, including many of the petitioners before you today, the university did not adopt any of their substantial recommendations. The Conference of Management Plan sets no limits on the, on the number of telescopes that could be built on Mauna Kea. What's worse, the university, instead of focusing on restoring natural environments, is focused in this hearing on disqualifying some of the practitioners as Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. The university actually contends that the practitioners before you today did not prove that they were Native Hawaiian. Very good. How can a university contend that Uncle Ku or Auntie Pua, Kumu Paul Nevis, or any of the other Native Hawaiian practitioners, practitioners are not worthy of the board's attention? These are the very practitioners <coughs> cited by the DLNR in their staff recommendation and cited by the university in their own reference material. Please do not be distracted by slippery lawyering. These petitioners are Native Hawaiian. They do engage in traditional and customary practices and should be granted the protections guaranteed to them by the state constitution. I realize that all of this liquid lowering and the 
long time that it's taken to get to this point has really muddied the case in some ways, made it complicated. So I'm going to take a moment to try and simplify it. Cahill and the university's attorney actually agree on quite a bit. We agree that the natural resources in Mauna Kea have suffered as a result of telescope construction. We agree that the university has been and continues to be the primary advocate for telescope construction on Mauna Kea. We agree that the TMT would contribute to some degree to the harm to existing resources on Mauna Kea. The difference is the university contends that it should be rewarded for this and granted a permit to build a new telescope and expand that harm. While we think enough is enough already. The general lease for the university's managed lands will come to an end soon. The TMT would be a significant new and permanent eyesore on the northern plateau of Mauna Kea. It is foolish to build such a massive industrial structure in an imperiled conservation area when the whole undertaking could come to an end before the TMT becomes obsolete. This is substantial adverse impact to anyone who enjoys the view from Mauna Kea to Haleakaba. Enough is enough already. Please deny the permit application for the TMT. to begin by acknowledging and thanking everyone here who takes personal responsibility to preserve, protect, and care for our mountain, Mauna Kea. I've worked for the university for many years. I have a great deal of aloha for the university. However, my involvement in issues regarding the management of Mauna Kea began in the 1970s. As a recreational hiker, I visited Mauna Kea with my father, who was a physicist and an astronomer when one telescope, smaller than the size of a garage, stood at the summit. The vast wilderness vistas from the highest peak in the Pacific were awe-inspiring, breathtaking, and serene. The sound of silence remains with me today. I returned to Mauna Kea as a hike leader with Lauren Gill while working at the Honolulu Botanic Gardens. I chaired the program committee of the Conservation Council of Hawaii in 1983 when I invited astronomers to present their plans for discussion at a public meeting. At that point, I was excited about what was going on on Mauna Kea. And I followed the development of the Mauna Kea Science Reserve Complex Development Plan in 1983 to 85 and remember the assurances regarding future compliance with administrative rules and limits on development. Expanded development on Mauna Kea was a very controversial topic in the community in the 1980s, <coughs> and one of my kupuna, May Mall, was very instrumental in raising some of the issues that remain with us today, 30 years later. Under pressure from Governor Ariyoshi and Mayor Kimura, the university promised a limit on the number of telescopes, a promise it no longer honors. I continue to use the trails and visit the summit of Mauna Kea during the 70s through the present for recreation, for wilderness experience, for the unfettered vistas and the silence and the spiritual peace and the natural beauty and the cultural significance. The cumulative impact of intensified industrial land use at the summit has really impacted my recreational enjoyment and spiritual practice. The, cultural, the cumulative impact of the destruction of habitat the widespread waste accumulation, the obstruction of the view planes, the constant sound and alteration of the geology, the negative impact of the cultural practice of my colleagues is a source of personal grief. The summit would be silent 
if there were no development, but it's not silent. The noise of the observatory, air conditioning, and blowers, generators, associated vehicles, and industrial activity is present and disturbing to many recreational users who hoped for the pristine silence of wilderness. The view of Mauna Kea's summit from my vantage point at my residence and from the beach at Hilo Bay and from my hiking trails on Mauna Loa are all fettered by the presence of multiple domes on the skyline. It's almost impossible to find a location on the island of Hawaii where one cannot see a telescope in one's view of Mauna Kea. I believe I'm not alone in finding these visual obstructions a significant annoyance and adverse impact. I remember Mayor Kimura saying the same thing. The legislative auditor in 1998, and I quote, said, the LNR has failed to define its relationship with the university. Allowing the institution to oversee its own activities and not provide a mechanism to ensure compliance with lease and permit requirements. The auditor also reported that without permit conditions or controls to ensure implementation of management plans, the university was allowed to continue development without completing prior tasks outlined in manage management plans. In 2003, my concerns led me to join a hui of practitioners, including Sierra Club, who took part in the contested case hearing and successful litigation to overturn the DLNR um, permit for the Keck Outrigger Telescope development due to the absence of a current comprehensive management plan to address multiple uses on Mauna Kea. We were forced to intervene in the DLNR's management of Mauna Kea because DLNR abdicated its duty and its responsibility under the law to preserve and protect the summit. The LNR failed to comply with its own administrative rules requiring that it manage the natural resources in the conservation district pursuant to a comprehensive management plan. They actively opposed the appellant's efforts to bring the LNR into compliance with its own rules. The LNR administrative rules explicitly state that astronomy facilities are among the uses requiring approved management plans to address cumulative land proposals. Cumulative. The DLNR staff members have claimed that the infrastructure on Mauna Kea is crumbling and that active management of resources is constrained by lack of funds. <coughs> this bolsters the argument that the petitioners have been making for years, fair market rent use needs to be paid for the world use of the world's premier astronomical location to pay for adequate resource management, infrastructure upkeep, and public safety. The LNR staff's position is that the only way to fund good management is to degrade the resource in order to collect rent from the new development to pay for the management's mistakes of the past. This is akin to a Ponzi scheme. The additive insult to the resource will not reduce the cumulative impact. This contested case has been conducted in order to provide information, examine the record, and demonstrate the harm this project will cause. We intend to provide the board with a better opportunity to make an informed decision regarding the 30 meter telescope application. I brought my concerns to this case because as a longtime recreational user, I felt it's my citizen's responsibility during these years to participate in dozens of hearings and meetings to help review and plan and propose appropriate management of the natural resources associated with Mauna Kea. I've contributed hundreds if not thousands of hours as a volunteer to this effort and not one hour has been compensated. Nor have I received any benefit from the effort other than the knowledge that Mauna Kea deserves the care and respect and this has been affirmed by the tremendous community support that this effort has generated. At the same time, the university has expended millions of taxpayer funds to pay outside attorneys to represent the interests of California-based TMT Corporation and its partners. If I believed that my efforts had led to appropriate management, I wouldn't be sitting here. Instead, I have suffered as I have observed the cumulative industrialization of the wild panorama of the summit. My best efforts have not remedied the habitat loss, the repeated pollution accidents, the introduction of multiple alien predators and weeds, the permanent and irreversible alteration of the geologic terrain, the summit landscape, which was once breathtakingly beautiful, has become more akin to a cityscape in my eyes. 
I hike to experience the wilderness, the ecosystems, and the habitats for native species, the constantly changing weather, the play of the light on the landscape, the serenity of silence, and the revelation of the ancestral and spiritual wisdom. The steady deterioration of the natural landscape, including the intrusion of visual distractions, noise, traffic, trash, access limitations, has really had a shattering impact on my recreational experience. To escape the sadness I feel when I'm surrounded by the buildings and the roads, I walk long distances to find landscapes free of the visual and psychic clutter. These places include the Northern Plateau and Pu'upoliahu, where I can gaze at Haleakala or Pu'umakanaka without the industrial distractions. For this reason, I maintain that the proposal to build a 30-meter telescope on the Northern Plateau of the Mount of Malakea summit region would further degrade the spoil and irrevocably harm my rights to a clean and healthful environment. The proposition that an 18-story, five-acre industrial structure proposed to be built in a national natural landmark would have no significant impact boggles the imagination. <coughs> the claim that the proposal is consistent with the purpose of the conservation district simply ignores the purpose set out in the law. Conservation districts were formed for the purpose of conserving, protecting, and preserving the important natural resources of the state through appropriate management to promote their long-term sustainability for the public health, safety, and welfare. The applicant contain, contends that virtually any telescope development they propose would be allowed because the comprehensive management plan and its subplans provide a framework of comprehensiveness and strength for managing development within the MKSR, I'm quoting. I strongly challenge that proposition. The CMP framework describes a functional management strategy, but it lacks actions to carry it out. And I assert that the criteria set forth in the law have not been met. Good intentions are empty promises if no action is taken to carry them out. A plan must actually be established with funding for managers with expertise in natural and cultural resources secured. An effective plan has timelines established. It has benchmarks to evaluate effectiveness of outcomes. It has effective BLNR oversight and consultation and enforcement for failure to act. The University of Hawaii is an educational institution. It's not a land management agency. The university claims to have a main management framework, but during the 12 years that I have served on the Environment Committee for UH's Office of Mauna Kea Management, no cultural or natural resource staff was employed to implement or manage these resources. In spite of the conditions set, in, set by DLNR in 1985, the plans, the permits, the monitoring, the control, and the remediation efforts that should have been in place for over a quarter of a century do not even exist. And UH OMKM lacks the staff and funds to carry them out. While some recommendations made by citizen scientists and, and practitioners over the years can be found in the CMP framework, the action to implement them is absent. So some of the issues that I bring to you are limits to development. While the number of telescopes and observatories already exceeds the upper limit named by the university in early management strategies, under the current management, the university has proposed 12 additional telescopes during the last 10 years. Only one's been implemented. The Master Plan 2000 and the Comprehensive Management Plan do not offer a rationale for the carrying capacity for the mountain, nor do they provide an accurate estimate of future development proposals anticipated. The university would have you believe that if the existing significant, substantial, adverse impact of 20 telescopes were 20, then the addition of one more telescope would be an additional increment of one, thus adding only one on the impact scale. And to quote from their document, that demonstrator demonstrably does not cause substantial adverse impacts. By the university's absurd <coughs> logic, if each and every new telescope were 10 times larger than the one that preceded it, and it were to construct 21 telescopes, the impact of the last, even though it's 1 million billion times larger than the first, would only be one on the impact scale. I show you this graph. I'm sorry, I constructed this last night about 11. But it's the only way I know to show you that this is one. 
Okay, this is one, and this is 100 billion million, and this is 10 times, each of these telescopes is 10 times larger than the next one. If that were the case, there would be one, more than one increment of in impact. And the absurdity of this, that's it, that's great. <laughs> the absurdity of this logic is played out when one considers the scale of the impact of the UH Hilo 24 inch telescope, which none of the petitioners objected to when it was rebuilt and uh, reconditioned and recycled. Anyway, I'd like to point that out because the university says we oppose all telescopes. That's not true. Um, the absurdity of the logic is played out when you look at the 24-inch telescope compared to this proposed telescope, which is 1,181 inches, that is more than 49 times larger than the first one. The impact to the habitat, the geologic resources, the view planes, the recreational and restorative environment is impacted to a far greater extent by the addition of a massive new element in the area, never before irrevocably altered by human forces. The university's postulate that the construction of a telescope larger than the footprint of all the others combined would not be significant in this context because the existing impact caused by its own management with DLNR oversight was negligent is patently self-serving. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Anyway, the destruction of habitat continues with no restoration. Since the university built its first telescope on Mauna Kea, 92 acres of Wekiu Bug habitat in the summit area have been destroyed by telescope development. This is their own document. But no habitat restoration has been initiated, nor is restoration a, a condition of this current proposal. In spite of the Master Plan 2000 EIS statements that no habitat disturbance would be proposed, no new habitat disturbance would be proposed, the university's TMT EIS states that the project would disturb or destroy an additional 5.6 acres of habitat. The mitigation efforts recommended by experts hired by UH OMKM to address the habitat destruction are for the most part absent from the mitigation proposed by the TMT CMP. And you can read them all in the draft EIS they were not incorporated into the final, and they were not incorporated into the CMP for the TMT. So you have to wonder, why was it so inconvenient that they listened to their own expert? Next, there's no invasive species management plan. During the 12 years since OMKM was established, several invasive species of both plants and animals have been introduced. In spite of good intentions, Monitoring for invasive species has been haphazard, and the control hasn't even been considered or initiated. The CMP calls for the development of an invasive species rapid response plan in conjunction with an invasive species monitoring plan for specific species considered the highest risks. But even these plans remain on the drawing board. Just as invasive species control and eradication permits for the science reserve are not yet in place 12 years later, nor are they in place for the TMP. During the decade of waiting for a plan, several new invasive and predatory insects have established a presence in the summit area. But during the contested case, OMKM Interim Director Nagata admitted that OMKM had no natural resources management staff. She said that funds for this purpose were not provided by the state legislature. Dependence on funds to be provided by our legislature in this cash-strapped economy demonstrates the failure of DLNR to follow the law requiring fair market rent for the use of our land. These funds should be used in part for appropriate management. The next is the inadequate hazardous waste plan, so our aquifers are risk. Under current management, accidental spills or hazardous, uh, hazardous materials and sewage continue to occur. In spite of good intentions, the materials continue to seep into the substrate and the aquifer. The applicant anticipates no accidents will befall the TMT and therefore assumes that protective measures in place ensure there will be no significant impact. These protective measures outlined in the EIS actually don't currently exist, nor do they exist in the science reserve as a whole. The CMP calls for guidelines and protocols for management of spills in the head of hazardous waste, including mirror washing fluids, wastewater, and fuel accidents. 
But test testimony from Director Nagata indicated that accidental releases within facilities are managed by each indi observatory's individual protocols. Outside the facilities, the leaks from vehicles might be handled by rangers overseen by the Mauna Kea Support Services, but no plan was identified for a larger spill, such as a truck carrying barrels of fuel. In its recommendations to the board, the LNR staff noted in a recent experience with a toxic material <coughs> spill in May 2009, when a hydraulic line broke, releasing seven to 12 gallons of fluid onto a concrete floor, leaking through a six inch drain pipe into the ground. When DLNR claimed the, the event was handled perfectly, it begs the question, why after numerous incidents of spills have entered the ground through unsealed pipes in the past, was this drain pipe sealed only after the spill? Sealing the drain after the spill is akin to closing the barn door after the horses left. With appropriate management, drains leading to the ground would have been closed, closed years ago. The, the university, and next is decommissioning. The university claims there will be fewer telescopes when the lease expires, but planners and the public are left in the dark about the details. The CMP decommissioning plan leaves specifics regarding the extent of site restoration undefined. As a result, the costs and risks associated with decommissioning are difficult to gauge. The DLNR's 1977 Mauna Kea Management Plan required that full funding be set aside for both construction and decommissioning of permitted telescopes, but no such requirements been put in place for the TMT. We learned this at the hearing, that funding is in place only through 2012, and that amount to be set aside for decommissioning is yet to be determined. Finally, the recreational resources are impacted by cumulative development. We're at 20 minutes. Okay, thanks. I'm almost done. The expanded individual, uh, sorry, it's expanded industrial development of telescope facilities, roads, visitor amenities, and commercial tourism adds a jarring element of distraction to the wilderness. The northern plateau of Mauna Kea is not entirely pristine, but the vast landscape the geologic terrain, the circle of shrines, and the silent interaction of light and shadow, the interplay of mist and snow on the plateau, are still a conservation resource treasured by the world. The loss of this resource would be irrevocable and is counter to the laws that protect this district. While TMP project claims it will make optimum use of the environmental factors associated with Mauna Kea, such as altitude and atmospheric clarity and distance from light sources, Unfortunately, the natural resources on the Earth's surface are placed at risk. The mitigation proposed does not address the impact of the TMP. The fourth criterion prohibits land uses that cause substantial adverse impact. Because the BLNR and the university have failed to address or mitigate the existing substantial impact on the mountain's resource, it's improper to consider any new projects that would contribute more impact in any way. The additive effect of additional development on the significant cumulative impact is not mitigated by aluminizing the dome, adding cultural furnishings to the inside of the building, or camouflage paint on the pull boxes, nor is off-site remediation. Funding of scholarships, while laudable, is not mitigation for resource destruction. It's important to note that the applicant has the burden of proving that mitigation measures offered would actually reduce the significant impact of the TMT project proposal to a less than significant level. The university's mitigation measures fail to do this. The TMT FEIS concedes that cumulative past, present, and reasonably foreseeable development activities are already significant, contribute a significant, substantial, and adverse impact, but the TMT would contribute to the existing state of impact. And there are no exceptions to the fourth criterion. The fourth criterion says that the level, that, that this must not take place. Um, the threshold of significance has already been surpassed on Mount Kea. The successive recommendations by DLNR staff and successive approvals by DLNR under deceptive assurances by the university that they can be good managers have led to this sorry, stat, sad state. The TMT project would contribute to that existing impact and it can't be granted a construction permit. Conservation district performed for the purpose of conserving, protecting, and, and 
preserving the important natural resources of the state to promote long-term sustainability. While purporting to do this through appropriate management, the record established through this hearing demonstrates that management appropriate for this purpose is not in place. As board members, it's your duty and your responsibility to protect the people's resources for the future. Amen. The eight criteria for permits in the conservation district are clear and all of them must be addressed. The proposal fails in this regard. Please exercise your duty and deny this permit. I will tell you though, when you, when you asked that question before, it occurred to me that when the additional hotel was built on Hapuna Beach and the place that I always took my children to go was overlaid by a very large hotel that dominated the landscape that was once a fairly beautiful place in Hapuna. I, I don't go there anymore. I've never gone there again. So yes, I would go to Mauna Kea, but it would be heartbreaking. <laughs> We're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Give our court reporters some much needed rest and opportunities for <coughs> people to do what they need to do. Sure.